Not everyone believes the government can change the glacial pace of rulemaking, as Tim Geithner said. Glenn Hubbard, dean of the Columbia Business School, writes in today's Wall Street Journal that Geithner's pledge is impossible to fulfill, and he's not unfamiliar with the ways of Washington. He is the former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President George W. Bush, and he joins us now. Dean uh, Hubbard, thank you so much for joining us. Sure. I, I thought it was an interesting speech by Tim Geithner because he started out saying we're going to do this so quickly, and then in the last paragraph he says it's going to take a decade or two. Uh, obviously, these things take time, and they take time for good reason. Well, they take time for uh, bad reason and good reason. The bad reason is the legislation itself was so rushed and so vague, it creates a lot of uncertainty, but also for good reason. You know, we require cost-benefit analysis and regulation, and that simply takes time. So I think the secretary was right toward the end of his speech. This will take some time, which frankly means a lot of uncertainty for businesses and consumers. What, what did you think about the rest of his speech? I mean, a lot of observers that we've had on this show were impressed by the speech. There was a lot of meat in it. He offered a lot of detail. He answered a lot of questions. Uh, it, it looked like really the first time Tim Geithner, someone ha said to me, really had his own project to work on and he, and he knocked the cover off the ball. Well, I think it was a very substantive speech that Secretary Geithner gave. My own disagreement with what he said is simply that the pace that he encouraged is simply not possible. And he knows that through the rulemaking procedures, through the way the Basel Accords actually work. And slightly more harmful, the way the legislation was managed by a lack of leadership from the administration has created uncertainty. That's a self-inflicted wound. All right, well, l let's move on uh, to tax cuts. You're the architect of the Bush tax cuts. Uh, Matt has been excited about talking about this all day. Literally, he will not shut up about talking to you <laughs> about the Bush tax cuts. If you knew back in 2001, 2003, we were going to see uh, the continued spending that we saw under the Bush administration, would you still have supported those cuts? Well, the first thing in, in any public finance problem is to decide what level of spending you want. And once you've decided that, then you've got to decide on a tax system to meet it. Right now, we're in a situation where spending is substantially higher than tax revenues, and we need to cut that spending. That, to me, is the first order question. If we don't, then we have to raise taxes. And the Bush tax cuts are only the down payment of a tax increase that would be necessary to ratify the present spending in the budget. Where, where would you cut specifically? Well, the long-term cuts needed are in the entitlement program, slowing down the rate of growth of entitlements for upper-income households. But we've also been on a, a discretionary spending binge in the country for more than a decade. And I think it's time to restrain government spending. That's a political decision. And if we decide not to, then we have to raise taxes and we have to have a broad discussion with the American people. The Bush tax cuts simply aren't sufficient to fund the spending the administration proposes. Let me add, you know, one of the depressing things for a lot of supply siders is that uh, you can't show empirical evidence that tax cuts actually work to boost revenue. Uh, what are your arguments for that? Well, I think that if you look at the panoply of tax cuts that went into the 2001 and the 2003 package, there's a great deal of economic evidence to suggest positive effects of changes in marginal tax rates and changes uh, on investment income, taxes on dividends and capital gains. Some elements of the tax cut uh, are good politics, but perhaps less uh, supportive of, of economic growth. The tax cuts don't, quote, pay for themselves, but they do create additional support for output and growth. You know, Art Laffer uh, told our columnist Carolyn Baum that the tax cuts uh, for the rich do pay for themselves. And you hear from the left an argument that those people don't spend the money, but Art Laffer points out uh, that they invest it in long-term growth. Do you think that we need to extend the tax benefits for everybody? Well, I think we've got to have a conversation of what the size of government is going to be in this country. My personal recommendation is we extend the Bush tax cuts for a period of time until we're willing to have that conversation, probably around the next presidential election, about the size of government and how we're going to pay for it with tax reform. It is certainly the case that tax rates at the top do have very powerful growth effects. It isn't just about who saves what. I wonder what you think about reworking the whole tax code. I mean, is that even a possibility considering that Congress seems to uh, thrive and function off the tax system the way it is? 
Well, it's certainly the case that we would benefit from tax reform, but I'm not aware of any tax reform that wouldn't have low marginal tax rates and an almost zero tax rate on investment income. So when the Obama administration says it wants tax reform, I'm all ears, but that's consistent with keeping low marginal rates and low dividend and capital gains rates. All right, hey, Dean Hubbard, thanks so much for joining us. Glenn Hubbard Pleasure. there, Dean of the Columbia Business School. We